so thankful to the Lord for all that he's done in my life. Amen, as, as you know. Um, so thankful for this church and the prayers of everybody in this church. Amen. So I'm just so thankful to God. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see all my family members here too as well. My nieces with their children uh, and things of that nature. Um, before we get into the word, how many, how many appreciate everything that God has done for them in their life? How many... Um, because <laughs> my mom will start. I'm going to start. I'm going to lose here. Praise God. Amen. My mom always wants to. <laughs> come on. But um, the reason why I ask is because we come here with a purpose. And, you know, it's, it's good to come to church. It's good to dress up. It's good to look good. It's, it's, it's good to come to hear the music and things of that nature. But our purpose is to praise and to worship God. You know, and sometimes we come in and it's a struggle. It's a struggle. Because all week long we've been going through all kind of things. Uh, sometimes some pain, some discomfort. Sometimes bills. Sometimes problems at the job. You know, sometimes problems in the ministry. It's like things are not going our way. You know, so when we get to the house of God, there's many obstacles that are placed before us. And sometimes our mind is just like it's polluted, it's contaminated, and it's like we feel like if our worship is not even going past the ceiling. But the devil is a liar. So I want you to stand with me a moment before we get into the, to stand with me, please, everyone. And before we get into the word of God, I want, you to, I want you to pray with me. Amen? I want you to close your eyes and begin to worship the Lord. To know that God is moving in the midst of us. It doesn't matter your circumstance, your situation. It doesn't matter what you're going through. I know that many have pain and many have missed discomfort, but I'm telling you right now, amen, Jesus is moving in the midst of us. And wherever he's at, there's going to be liberty to worship him, to praise him. All the sickness, the disease, the infirmity, everything has to go. Every thought that's not lined up with the word of God, every thought that is not of God, we take captive right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you, Father, to move in the midst of us, to open our understanding so that we can mentally be able to grasp, spiritually be able to grasp what you have in store for us today, Lord. Break all chains, almighty God. Deliver us from all things, oh Lord. Today we want to put, we want our lives to be in a position to not only hear, to not only be hearers of your word, but then to go out and to go forth and be doers of your word. We want your word to be sent out into our lives, and we know that you will perform the very thing you send it to do. And that's what we ask you to do, Father. If you'll go to the word with me, to Revelations chapter 22, verse 17. You know, I, I ministered in prison for 15 years, all in Spanish. And before that, when I was young, I served the Lord for seven years, and I did that in Spanish too as well. So I've been ministering in English for about a year and a couple months only. And all the verses I know are in Spanish, so sometimes I try to translate them and it don't come out the way that I want it to come out. You know, but um, today God has something special for us. And as I was, I was sitting there meditating on what God had for us, the Lord began to point out a lot of things. So I just asked the Lord to, to glorify himself here today. Amen. So we read the word of God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that hear it say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Father, your word is like the, the rain and the snow that, uh, that refreshes the earth. It doesn't only refresh in the earth, Almighty God, but it refreshes the sea when it becomes dry. Then that sea quickens and it comes to life. And it begins to do that which you have created it to do, my Lord. Which is to multiply and bring forth fruit. I know that there's seed in our heart. The word of God is in our heart. And I know sometimes that word becomes stale, Almighty Lord. So we ask you, Father, to refresh him, that word that is in our heart today, Almighty God. So that when we go forth, so that when we go out, Almighty Lord, that we will begin to multiply and bring forth fruit that is worthy of repentance, Almighty God. So that we will begin to do that which you have called us to do is to take this word to every creature, Almighty God. In the name of Jesus, we trust you, my Lord. Amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated. 
As I could tell that you looked at the bulletin, and by the bulletin, you know what we're speaking about is man being a, a free moral agent. You know, when I was young, my mom from a very early age, so from when I can remember, um, bef before I came out the womb, my mother was already serving the Lord. And from a very young age, she, she took us to church. And many times, uh, she basically had to drag us there. And many times we hid, and we didn't go. But every time I was in church, it didn't matter if I was distracted. It didn't matter if I was paying attention. Somehow, some way, God figured it out, and God got my attention. People would come from all over, different churches, different women of God, whoever it was, or if it was a Sunday school teacher, and they all said the same thing. God has great things for you. I remember when I was little, my great-grandmother told, uh, I, I was very sick, I was very ill, and she gave me a bath uh, in, in alcohol. And she said when she began to pray for me, God began to speak to her, and God began to tell her, nothing's going to happen to me, he's going to be okay. I have great things for him. And as I grew up, it was the same thing. If, if I visited a church, I remember I was 15 years old and I was here in Florida. I was in Op Opelaka. I had gotten in some trouble and I wasn't doing things right. My father couldn't handle me. <laughs> Even my father couldn't handle me. And he, my mother sent me to, uh, to some friends. And at that church, I was at a church one day and they began to minister in Spanish. I didn't even understand them. And as they began to minister, something began to happen. There was something in my heart, on my mind. I just couldn't resist it. I began to cry, and I began to cry, and I knew that what was calling me was, 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 was uh, drawing me to the altar. But again, I began to resist, and I was with this family, and I was with their daughter, and I got up at the church, and I ran. And I ran, I hid behind a green dumpster, and all I did was cry. As I felt the Lord calling me. But I didn't listen. And time after time and time again, it didn't matter where I went. It didn't matter the drugs that I did. It didn't matter the condition or the state that I was in. It didn't even matter that people would look at me and say, this guy is lost. There is no hope for him. Wherever I was and whatever I was doing, God would begin to call me. And I knew that I had to make a choice. It was either to accept the Lord or to continue living how I was living. And we know what that life brings. And if you don't, I want you to hear me today. The only thing that the streets will bring, the only three things that you will obtain through the streets is jails, institution, and death. I don't care, like, like, like my father was talking about today, that many people talk about many different ways or, or many different roads. I want you to understand that any way or any road that doesn't lead you to Jesus will lead you to jails, institutions, and death. You can feel as strong as you want to feel, as intelligent as you want to feel, all your diplomas, all your titles, all your positions, and all your money will never be able to deliver you from the, from the wages of sin, which is death, eternal separation from God. And what I want you to know is that Jesus, while he was on this earth, he spoke about, uh, more about hell than he did heaven. So if you don't think that it's a reality, wake up because it is. And he said that it's a place that the fire shall never be quenched. Your thirst will never be quenched, where the worms will never die, and where the gnashing of teeth will never end. So it is a reality. And I was on that road. I was headed towards death. But the thing about it was, it was a decision that I made. I knew it every day as I woke up, and I, and I began to, well, as soon as I woke up, and I had that monkey on my back, the streets were calling me. And everything that had to do with the streets. It wasn't just the drugs. It wasn't just the alcohol. It was the women. It was the gang banging. It was all these different things that were calling me to the streets. And every day that I got up, I knew that God wanted to save me. I knew that God wanted to deliver me. I knew that God wanted me to serve him. But I made a decision to serve the world. And the consequences were jails and institutions. And it almost led me to death. By the mercies of God, and I know the men, the men here from Hot Costa Hope know exactly what I'm talking about. Because we were all on that way, we were all on that road. We were all fooled and deceived by the things that the world offers. Like when the Spirit of God took Jesus into the desert, and the Bible says that the devil, the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Yes, that's what the devil does. He's going to show you all the kingdoms of the world. 
He's going to show you that lifestyle. He's going to tell you you can obtain riches and you can. He's going to tell you you can obtain property and he can. He's going to tell you that you can obtain many different things and many women all over the world. Yes, you can do those things, but he won't tell you is what Jesus told the man that was storing up the things in the storehouse. You fool. Don't you know tonight they're coming for your soul? That's the difference. When they come for your soul, if, it's not, if, if what's living in your soul is not the Holy Spirit, if you have not been sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption, I'm going to tell you where you're going to go. Straight to hell. The wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. When there came a moment, as you know, as you've heard, God reached my life. My life hit the bottom of, of the pit. I was lost. Without faith, without hope, all doors were closed. When God touched my life, he touched my heart. He spoke to me. And I listened. And I made a decision. I decided to say, you know what? I tried drugs and I didn't find nothing there. Women weren't able to satisfy me. The nightlife, the streets, the money wasn't able to fill that void and that emptiness that I had in my heart. So I made a, a conscious decision to give my heart over to Jesus and everything has changed. My life has changed. But it was a decision. See, many people find themselves in different situations and different problems and circumstances in life. And instead of uh, accepting the fact that, that, that you are responsible for those choices that you made that put you in that position, the first thing they say is, why God? They tend to blame God. And they say that God is at fault for their situation. God is at fault for their condition. That God is at fault for the children being in the world. They never look in the mirror and accept responsibility for the poor decisions that they've made in life. But I come to tell you something. You can blame God all you want for your situation, for your circumstance. But whatever you're going through is the poor decisions that you've made in life. But there's a great thing about God. You can make all the poor decisions that you've made. Your situation could look as chaotic as it does when you give your heart to Jesus. When you decide to turn your will over to the care of God. Amen. When you decide to give your life over to God, immediately things begin to change. Things begin to change. And let me tell you something. This is not just for non-believers. This is for the church. This is for the children and the people of God. Because many times we're in church, but we're playing church. We have a foot in church and we have a foot outside of church. See, many times we're on the fence. Many times we think that we can play church or that we can serve God and we can serve the world. But I want you to tell you something. The word of God says that the world and its desires shall pass. And only he who does the will of God shall remain forever. I don't say but God says that he who loves the world, that the love of God is not in him. The Bible has not called us to conform to the world, but the Bible has called us to be lights of the world and salt of the earth. The Bible has called us to be like the image of Christ so that the world can conform to Christ and not the world to Christ. God is powerful. To the book of Revelations today, it's a book that I love. All the word of God is inspired by God. It's all influenced by God. It's God's breath. And no man has ever spoken in of himself when it comes to the word of God. But those men that wrote the word of God were inspired by God. The Holy Spirit told them, sit down and write. So there's no confusion in the word of God. But for some reason... Book of Revelations has always, it's always attracted me to it. It's always drawn me to it. And I've always gotten into the book of Revelations. And it's just impacting because every course of life, listen good, this generation, those of us who are hearing me today, I want you to understand something. And God has chosen us before the foundations of the world for this moment, for this time. Because all the course of life, and everything that man has been through and things that they're going to soon go through, I want you to understand, point to the book of Revelations. Everything is being set up for that moment. 
And this revelation, the Bible says that there was a revelation given from the Father to the Son, to the angel, to John, John to the angel of the seven churches, they delivered to the seven churches, and now it's for me and you today. Because the Bible says that all the scriptures given by God for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, and so that the man of God could be whole and complete and be ready for all good work. So this word is for us. The word revelation means uncovering and unveiling. And what's happening with the uncovering and the unveiling is it's like the curtain being lifted so that all can see the same thing and they can see it alike. I want you to understand something that the purpose of the book of Revelation is so that you can have a visual. God wants you to be able to a visual, have a visual of some things. He told John to write these things down, these things that you see, the things which are, and the things that are going to happen hereafter. And the things that he's talking about are specific events. And God wants you to have a visual of it so that you can see exactly what it looks like so that we are not deceived. So the first thing he tells him to write down what he sees. And it's, it brings to my attention, this is very interesting because the, uh, the, 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 the apostle John walked with Jesus for three and a half years. So he knew what Jesus looked like. There was nobody on earth that can tell you. The Bible says that the apostles were eyewitnesses. They walked with him for three and a half years, but yet John did not recognize this figure in chapter 1. And Jesus told him, I mean, and, and, and he was told to write the things which you saw, what he saw. So he's describing this person, but little does he know. The Bible said that when he's seen this person, and he begins to describe him, that he felt like he was dead. Because nobody could see God. Because if you do, huh, you already know what it is. So he felt as if he was dead, but this figure came and put his hand on him, and he quickly, he came to life. And the figure told him exactly he was. He says, it is I, the Alpha, the Omega, he who was alive, he who died, and he who rose from the dead. So he was speaking about Jesus himself. But now he was seeing Jesus in a different light. He was seeing him in his glorified form as God. Wow, that's powerful. Because in the book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, teaches us that Jesus at some point emptied himself out. He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a servant made like man. He was made like man. The difference between him and man was his father wasn't an earthly father but a heavenly one. He was divine in nature. But he emptied himself out. That godly form, he spoke about having a glory with the Father at the beginning, and he wanted to restore to him. Part of it had to do with his form of godliness. John didn't recognize him. But when Jesus spoke, immediately he recognized him. So he began to write down the things he was seeing, what he was looking at, Jesus in his glorified form. And not only was he in glorified form, but he let him know, I got the keys to death, and I got the keys to hell. I got the authority over death and hell. So that's one thing that we have to realize when we're walking in life. That we're not just serving anybody. We're serving Jesus Christ, who is the son of the living God, who was God in the flesh, who is now resurrected and is standing at the right hand of the Father. And he has all power, for, all power and authority in earth and in heaven. Sometimes we don't realize that when we go through difficult situations. I got a bill to pay when you serve Jesus Christ. Oh, I, well, I, 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 I got a sickness. My, my daughter's sick or my son is sick or he's in drugs. Don't you know you serve Jesus? Don't you know that he has the power and the authority over anything that goes on here on earth and he can deliver your son. He can meet that bill. Whatever it is, he can do it. But the Bible says you have not because you ask not. We have not because we ask not. Sometimes fear paralyzes us. It cripples us when in the midst of a situation. I know because I've been there. My first daughter was born sick, clinging to her life without even taking her first step yet. And fear crippled me. It paralyzed me. I didn't know what to do. And my mother-in-law kept telling me pray. And my grandmother kept telling me pray. And my mother kept telling me pray. But I was so paralyzed with fear that I would lose my daughter. And I remember one day, 
throwing myself on the floor of my house, I couldn't take it no more. Because every report I got was evil. And I cried out to God. And I cried out to God. And my wife cried out to God. And we got to the hospital the next day. She was no longer on that floor. I began to panic. She began to panic. And the doctor said, relax, relax. Your daughter's already on a normal floor. We're about to release her. And then boom, my second daughter. My mom, my grandmother right there, my father right there. My second daughter, again, clinging to life. They said she had a heart disease, a blood disease, and that the chromosomes had crossed, and she had a touchdown syndrome. They didn't know if she was going to make it. Once again, we had to begin praying and crying out to God. Praying and crying out to God. When we got to the hospital, to All Children's Hospital in Tampa, the doctors called me upstairs and began to ask and question me, who told you she had a heart disease? I said, well, it's right there in the report, the doctor such and such. Who told you she had a blood disease? Well, come on, you guys, you guys can see that. He said, well, we don't see nothing. You can take your daughter home. It's the power of God. We need to know that we're serving the Jesus Christ that is not in the tomb. He's not in the grave. Hallelujah. And not only did he resurrect, but the Bible says he ascended. And he's at the right hand of the Father. And he has all power on earth and in heaven. And he gave that power to you. And he told us to go out and make disciples out of the nation. Healing the sick and delivering those that are possessed. That's what John saw. And then he began to write the things which are. And those things were the seven churches that existed in Asia Minor at that time. There were seven churches. And really when we begin to study these seven churches and about these seven churches, we do it in a threefold way. We look at them as a local church that did exist then. We look at them in a prophetical aspect referring to ourselves and as a church and as a whole. What things apply to us in them searching seven churches? Where is Christ the King or where Christ the King may be failing in certain areas? Where is Christ the King weak in certain areas? And then we take that and we apply that prophetically. And then what do we do? We correct those things. Because that's what Jesus said to each one of those churches that had something wrong. He said, I want you to correct that which you have wrong. Yes, I will commend you for these things, but I will condemn you for these. So you need to fix these things so that when I come, I don't have to remove that candlestick from his place. Hallelujah. That's the word of God. Now that nobody's perfect. And then we can apply him on an individual way. We don't like to do that. <laughs> That's tough for me to do. Because when I begin to look at those seven churches and I begin to look at my seven different Christian type of Christians and how it applies to me, it begins to expose my weaknesses and my frailties. It begins to show me who I are. That's what the word of God does. Amen. See, in the book of James, it's very clearly when it speaks about the power of the word of God in chapter 4 and it compares it to a mirror. It says you have some that look into a mirror and they stay a long time. What does the mirror do when they stay before the mirror in a long time? It points out its blemishes, its imperfections, its weaknesses, its deformities. It lets you know that you're not perfect just as your neighbor's not perfect. So when you stay in the word of God for a long time, the word of God shows you how much we depend upon Jesus, how much we depend upon prayer, how much we depend upon speaking in tongues, how much we depend upon the power of God manifested in our lives. But there's some that don't spend a lot of time in the word of God. They look real quick, boom, and they're gone. What happens to them after they've gone, aw after they've gone away for a little while? They forget that they're imperfect, just like I am. They forget that they have deformities just like I do. They forget that they have imperfections just like I do. And they begin to judge and they begin to condemn. They begin to criticize. And Jesus says, be careful that you judge not. Because the same way you judge and the same way you measure the next man is the same way I'm going to judge and measure you too as well. And then he said he spoke about a third thing. 